Hi everyone, and welcome to There and Back Again, an exploration of Tolkien's Middle-earth. I'm Alistair Stevens. Tonight, in our 59th session, we catch up on chapters 4 and 5 of Book 5 of The Lord of the Rings and set the stage for the Battle of the Pelennor Fields in next week's reading, which is going to be pretty big and does spur us onward. Like the writers of Rohan, we are tasked with a certain haste, a certain urgency in this week's reading, just to clear the slate so that we can set some, some respectful time aside for the Battle of the Pelennor Fields. Probably the most dense, probably the most rich, probably the most rewarding chapter in the entirety of The Lord of the Rings. I cannot wait to talk about that next week, but there is some really good stuff this week. I was going to say, in fact, that this week, in fact, I did say in last week's session that this week's session includes my favorite piece of Anglo-Saxon poetry. Turns out that's not true. Turns out that uh, week by week, I am surprised by the richness of uh, Professor Tolkien's Anglo-Saxon poetry. Next week, we're going to get my favorite example from Aomer, but this week, we're going to get a pretty damn fine example from Theoden King. But that is in our last slide of the evening. So let's see what we can do. Before before we get started, a quick note on one of the most distinctive and elusive techniques that Professor Tolkien has been using here in the early part of The Return of the King. Actually, if we're being completely honest, all the way through The Lord of the Rings, but, but more powerfully than ever here at the beginning of The Return of the King. We are talking here about parataxis and hypotaxis. We are talking, if you prefer your Latin roots, coordination and subordination. This is a syntactical technique where we take independent clauses and array them side by side conventionally paratactical formations are delineated with conventional punctuation. We will have periods or perhaps semicolons linking these independent thoughts, this rush of sensory impressionistic detail. But Professor Tolkien does what good storytellers do, I think, and oftentimes combines this with conjugations. He will use and and but and therefore to drive the action forward and to give us this rush. In fact, I've pulled a very short slide from last week's reading just to show how this works. But now the dark, swooping shadows were aware of the newcomer. One wheeled towards him, but it seemed to Pippin that he raised his hand and from it a shaft of white light stabbed upwards. The Nazgul gave a long, wailing cry and swerved away, and with that the four others wavered. And then rising in swift spirals, they passed away eastward, vanishing into the lowering cloud above and down on the Pelennor. It seemed for a while less dark. You see how we present all of these details combined with semicolons in this instance and with the word and? This creates the, the impression for the reader that these events are happening simultaneously, but they are not subordinate to one another. That is to say, we are not, as we would in a hypotactical construction, creating a hierarchy of detail here. It is not true that Peregrine Took is looking forth from Minas Tirith and first assessing one detail and then analyzing, discerning a, a subordinate detail and then another subordinate detail. He's not delving deeper into the subject matter that he's witnessing here. He's delving wider, I suppose. And that gives us this kinetic, dynamic, impressionistic rush of detail. And I would argue, in fact, that this is also the impulse that gives us all of the pseudo-biblical language that we've been so celebrating in the pages of The Return of the King up to this point. All of the lows and beholds and so it was, right? When we say, and so it was, we are connecting that thought, that sentence, that fragment, that idea, that detail backward and forward in time. We are creating this, this paratactical notion of, of impressionistic detail, I suppose. We are giving the reader a rush of information rather than a cleanly delineated order of information. And that just creates this dizzying spectacle of action that's going to unfold in particular in this week's reading and in next week's reading. So let's, uh, it also, as Varig of Khan says here in the chat, it creates an accelerated time flow. It does, absolutely. We're getting this, um, this idea that, that things are not necessarily happening one after the other, though they are clearly happening one after the other, right? The Nazgul gave a long wailing cry and swerved away, and with that the four others wavered. So that happens afterward, but it... Uh afterward. It happens at the same time. It happens as an effect of the primary cause. Here, the primary cause being Gandalf, right? Then the Nazgul gives a long wailing cry and swerves away, and with that the four others wavered, and then rising in swift spirals they passed away eastward, vanishing into the lowering cloud above, and down on the Pelennor it seemed for a while less dark. If we think about that in a classic hypotactical construction, the Nazgul gave a long wailing cry and swerved away, period. With that, the f or just not even with that, the four others wavered, and then rising in swift spirals they passed away eastward, vanishing into the lowering cloud above, period. Down on the Pelennor it seemed for a while less dark. 
the subordination of each incidental detail to the preceding detail there gives us a sense of passing time and a greater sense of cause and effect. It diminishes that immediate, riotous, anarchic feeling of action that is unfolding before us. So I just wanted to delve a little bit into the, uh, the syntactical analysis, I suppose, of what Professor Tolkien is doing so effectively here in The Return of the King. I absolutely love these constructions, and I'm framing this, of course, because we're going to get a lot of this tonight. Let's get into chapter four, then. We'll pick up with last week's reading with, uh, with Pippin asking Gandalf about hope, one of our favorite subjects here on There and Back Again. All now took leave of the Lord of the City and went to rest while they still could. Outside there was a starless blackness, as Gandalf, with Pippin beside him bearing a small torch, made his way to their lodging. They did not speak until they were behind closed doors. Then at last Pippin took Gandalf's hand. Tell me, he said, is there any hope? For Frodo, I mean, or at least mostly for Frodo? Gandalf put his hand on Pippin's head. There never was much hope, he answered. Just a fool's hope, as I've been told. And when I heard of Kirith Ungol... He broke off and strode to the window as if his eyes could pierce the night in the east. Kirith Ungol, he muttered. Why that way, I wonder. He turned. Just now, Pippin, my heart almost failed me hearing that name. And yet in truth, I believe that the news that Faramir brings has some hope in it. For it seems clear that our enemy has opened his war at last and made his first move while Frodo was still free. So now, for many days, he will have his eye turned this way and that away from his own land. And yet, Pippin, I feel from afar his haste and fear. He has begun sooner than he would. Something has happened to stir him. Gandalf stood for a moment and thought. Maybe, he muttered. Maybe even, your, maybe even your foolishness helped, my lad. Let me see, some five days ago now, he would discover that we had thrown down Saruman and had taken the stone. Still, what of that? We could not use it to much purpose or without his knowing. Ah, I wonder. Aragorn. His time draws near, and he is strong and stern underneath Pippin, bold, determined, and able to take his own counsel and dare great risks at need. That may be it. He may have used the stone and shown himself to the enemy, challenging him for this very purpose. I wonder. Well, we shall not, we shall not know the answer till the riders of Rohan come, if they do not come too late. There are evil days ahead. To sleep while we may. But, said Pippin. But what, said Gandalf, only one will I allow tonight. Gollum, said Pippin. How on earth could they be going about with him, even following him? And I could see that Faramir did not like the place he was taking them to any more than you do. What is wrong? I cannot answer that now, said Gandalf. Yet my heart guessed that Frodo and Gollum would meet before the end, for good or for evil. But of Kirith Ungol I will not speak tonight. Treachery, treachery, I feel, treachery of that miserable creature. But so it must be. Let us remember that a traitor may betray himself and do good that he does not intend. It can be so, sometimes. Good night. I want to call out first, of course, the the physical action here. We were talking about this a little in last week's session, in fact. Those moments in which the professor is content to express deep and profound emotion, deep and profound connection through the action of the characters rather than through the dialogue of the characters. Professor Tolkien, of course, has a well-deserved reputation for writing immaculate dialogue, and yet those moments in which he takes a half step back and allows his characters to act instead can be every bit as compelling, arguably even more compelling. We see here from Pippin a real and true and genuine fealty to Gandalf at this point. Then at last Pippin took Gandalf's hand. And we see in return Gandalf laying his hand upon the head of Pippin, a gesture which may to us in the modern world feel somewhat condescending, but which should feel condescending in the older form of that word, right? In the older meaning of that word. It is an act of condescension. To place his hand upon Pippin's head is a kingly, regal act. Here, Pippin and Gandalf, without words, are solemnizing a bond that stands in contrast to Pippin's bond with Lord Denethor, of course. Pippin has taken Denethor's service, absolutely, but Denethor does not feel the way about Pippin that, that Gandalf feels about Pippin. This is their moment of connection. And of course, this is the spark that brings us back to this question of hope. Tell me, is there any hope for Frodo, I mean, or at least mostly for Frodo? Pippin asking here, what of the fate of the ring? And also, parenthetically, us here in Minas Tirith, now that the war is come, now that the dawnless day has dawned, what are we to do? What is going to become of us? And Gandalf assures him, as he has assured many people from the beginning of the story, there never was much hope, just a fool's hope, as I've been told. But Kirith Ungol is something different. Kirith Ungol is something entirely other, and yet Gandalf manages to discern in the course of this passage exactly what has happened. Well, almost exactly what has happened, right? 
Was it Aragorn's intent when he wielded the Palantir, when he wrested the stone of Orthanc from the will of Saruman, when he uncloaked himself and showed Sauron, as you'll remember, the blade that was broken and now reforged, when he showed him Narsil that was, Andril that is, and, and revealed himself to be the returning king? Was it Aragorn's intent to draw the eye of the enemy? Well, yes, I think so, but it doesn't seem to be a strategic choice as much as it is a choice of fate, of good order, I suppose, that this is the moment, this is the appointed hour for Aragorn to reveal himself. And Gandalf suggests that too. Aragorn, his time draws near. There is a time for Aragorn, and it has not yet begun, or perhaps it already has. He is strong and stern underneath Pippin, bold, determined, able to take his own counsel and dare great risks at need. That may be it. Gandalf has, in fact, figured it out completely. Sauron has looked into the West and seen well, not just the heir of Isildur and Elendil, of course, not just the returning king, not just the blade that was broken at the uh, Battle of the Last Alliance, the, the blade that took the ring from his hand in the hands of Isildur, but also his suspicion is that Aragorn has the ring, right? It, it, he's not just thinking about Anduril as a symbol of that thing which hurt him, that weapon which, which hurt him so, you know, 3,000 years ago. He's also thinking of the thing which that weapon took as a consequence. He's thinking now of the ring, which is why he is acting so hastily. Uh, this is why he is, is launching his, his all-out assault on Minas Tirith and on the West before he is ready, before, we might argue, it is wise. And then, of course, Gollum. Pippin's one permitted but here at the end of this passage. Gollum, said Pippin, how on earth could they be going about with him, even following him? And I could see that Faramir did not like the place he was taking them to any more than you do. What is wrong? Seems as though Pippin is kind of finding a loophole here in, in Gandalf's protestation that he will only accept one but because he has two questions. Okay, Gollum, why on earth would Frodo and Sam be going with Gollum? And also, Faramir doesn't like this Kirith Ungol place any more than you do. What's up with that? What is wrong, he asks. To which Gandalf responds with, well, this is a very familiar beat, right? He gave this speech or a version of this speech to Frodo all the way back at the beginning of the Fellowship of the Ring. This is Gandalf's, you know, slim hope but not no hope. This is Gandalf's uh, simultaneous hope for the redemption of Gollum and also his belief that Gollum will have a role to play. I cannot answer that now, yet my heart guessed that Frodo and Gollum would meet before the end. Indeed, back in the Shire, it seems as though that is when Gandalf's heart guessed that this would be the case. For good or for evil, even back in the Shire, he didn't claim any knowledge of what Gollum's ultimate role would be, for good or ill, as he said at the time. But of Kirith Ungol, I will not speak tonight. Treachery, treachery, I fear, treachery of that miserable creature. It seems that Gandalf has also discerned Gollum's plan, or Gollum's scheme here. Why else would he take the hobbits to Kirith Ungol in the first place? But so it must be, and then he gives us well, the brightest beacon of hope that we might have in this dawnless day. Let us remember that a traitor may betray himself and do good that he does not intend. It can be so, sometimes. Good night. And of course, that's the heart of eucatastrophe, right? Or hmm, not necessarily the heart of eucatastrophe, I suppose. Eucatastrophe can also be natural. Eucatastrophe does not have to be brought about by treachery, by betrayal, by even evil intent. Sometimes things can just go wrong, and then that allows for that intercessory grace, which we've discussed so many times before. But evil is, more often than not, its own undoing. And when I say that, I don't mean that evil is is fated to be a passing threat because it will consume itself. But when evil falters in Middle-earth, in Arda, in the Lord of the Rings, it does so because it is itself evil. Evil sows the seeds of its own destruction. That is utterly reliable. Yes. Good. Let's uh, push on to uh, to Faramir. Faramir has returned to Minas Tirith, as we saw. Of course, we have Gandalf interceding with the Nazgul to save Faramir and his riders, and we get this. That was but a trial, said Faramir. Today we may make the enemy pay ten times our loss at the passage and yet rule the exchange, for he can afford to lose a host better than we to lose a company. And the retreat of those that we put out far afield will be perilous if he wins across in force. And what of Kyra Andros, said the prince? That too must be held if Osgiliath is defended. Let us not forget the danger on our left. The Rohirrim may come, but they may not. But Faramir has told us of great strength drawing ever to the Black Gate. More than one host may issue from it and strike for more than one passage. Much must be risked in war, said Denethor. Kyra Andros is manned, and no more can be sent so far. But I will not yield the river and the Pelennor unfought. Not if there is a captain here who still has the courage to do his lord's will. Then all were silent. But at length Faramir said, I do not oppose your will, sire, 
Since you are robbed of Boromir, I will go and do what I can in his stead if you command it. I do so, said Denethor. Then farewell, said Faramir. But if I should return, think better of me. That depends on the manner of your return, said Denethor. Gandalf it was that last spoke to Faramir ere he rode east. Do not throw your life away rashly or in bitterness, he said. You will be needed here for other things than war. Your father loves you, Faramir, and will remember it ere the end. Farewell. Gandalf here slipping into that prophetic register that we have so often attributed to Aragorn of late. Gandalf, we must remember, has at least as strong a sense of the unfolding of history as Aragorn does. And Gandalf, in his way, as we just discussed in the last slide, well, I hesitate to say is as kingly, is as regal as Aragorn, son of Arathorn, heir of Isildur and Elendil, returning king to the throne of Gondor and Arnor, you know, the last man of pure Numenor blood here in Middle-earth. Gandalf may not be as regal, he may not be as kingly, but he is certainly as noble. And he then possesses that gift of prophecy in much the same way. Do not throw your life away rashly or in bitterness. You will be needed here for other things than war. Your father loves you, Faramir, and will remember it ere the end. Farewell. We're going to talk more about uh, about the prince in just a couple of slides' time when, in fact, he returns with Faramir. More on that later. So the new day is uh, March the 11th. We are currently at March the 11th here in our unfolding timeline. And there is, too, a little note of irony here from Denethor particularly because, as you'll recall in last week's reading, Pippin was just observing how well-informed Denethor is, how, gosh, preternaturally well-informed Denethor is. It seems as though Denethor knows the comings and goings of many great things in Middle-earth, but Denethor here is wrong. According to Tolkien's schema, Kyr Andros has already fell. Kyr Andros is the uh, the ship-shaped island in the middle of the Anduin, right? It acts as a bridging station between the uh, western bank and eastern bank, or I suppose if you are the orcs coming from the Black Gate, the eastern bank and the western bank of the Anduin. It is a kind of representative no man's land. Here, uh, Kyr Andros in Sindarin translates to ship of long foam. That is to say that, that Kyr means means ship and Andros is, gives us the river and the length. So we get, yes, the, the ship of long foam because it is ship-shaped right there in the middle of the Anduin. So Faramir rides off here at the instruction of his lord this terse and bitter instruction of his lord. I will not yield the river and the Pelennor unfought, not if there is a captain here who still has the courage to do his lord's will. So Faramir is pointing out, that was but a trial. Today we may make the enemy pay ten times our loss at the passage and yet rue the exchange. We can kill ten times more orcs than they kill stalwart men of Gondor and we will still come out worse. That is just, that is not a math that is ever going to work in our favor. For he can afford to lose a host better than we to lose a company. He can lose an entire army before we lose a regiment. We are going to lose. If this comes down to math, if this is just a battle of numbers, then we are sunk. We are hopeless. We are never, ever going to win that fight. We have to hold the passages, but to do so will be enormously costly. This is only a matter of time. Eventually, the host of, of Mordor will overcome Minas Tirith, will overcome every last bastion of light in Middle-earth. There's no way to win save for a reckless chance, some hope in, in the East right now. Uh, so the prince intervenes, what of Kyr Andros? That too must be held if Osgiliath is defended. And Denethor says, no, it is held. Kyr Andros is manned and no more can be sent so far. I cannot send more men to Kyr Andros. It is simply too distant right now. But I will not yield the river and the Pelennor on fault. Not if there is a captain here who still has the courage to do his lord's will. And then there is this moment of silence, this unspoken slam at his younger son, Faramir. But at length, Faramir says, I do not oppose your will, sire. Since you are robbed of Boromir, I will go and do what I can in his stead if you command it. Okay, I'm not here to fight you. I will be a loyal soldier of Gondor. I will be a loyal son to you, Lord Denethor. Obviously, you would prefer to have Boromir do this task. But since he's not here, I will go and do the best that I can in his stead. Faramir even acknowledging, and it probably won't be as good as Boromir would have done, right? Boromir probably was a greater warrior than Faramir, but not, I think, resolutely a greater man. I do so, says Denethor, and Faramir takes his leave. Then farewell, but if I should return, think better of me. And Denethor cannot resist that last parting shot, right? Faramir knows that he is going into war. He knows that this is going to be incredibly dangerous and that victory is 
Well, God, a slim hope, if there's any hope at all, right? The best that he can do is, is forestall the passage of the host of Mordor at this point. He is almost certainly going to do so at the cost of his own life. And you'll note that even Gandalf is not blind to the possibility that Faramir will fall. Do not throw your life away rashly or in bitterness, he says. But you may be called upon to throw it away with nobility, to throw it away with heroism, to be the stalwart man of Gondor that we know you to be. But Denethor can't resist that last barb. That depends on the manner of your return implied there that if you fail, then you are no son of mine, or at least our relationship will not improve should you fail to hold the river, should you fail to hold Osgiliath, should you fail to forestall the encroaching horde of Mordor here. Let's keep moving on. Um, yeah, Tom's saying, so despite Denethor being awful, he's still trying to fight. He hasn't given up yet. No, he hasn't given up yet. But he will. And of course, we're going to have to look very carefully at the opposition between Denethor and Theoden King, right? We're going to see another example of what distinguishes these two men, what distinguishes in a really interesting and complex way, the steward and the king. And I have to say that in this read of The Lord of the Rings, I have been paying more attention to that than I ever have in the past. What differentiates Theoden and Denethor? And to what degree can that differentiation be attributed to their different roles or the different purity of their roles, I suppose. Theoden is king in Rohan. He is appointed. He is his nation, and Denethor is not. He is quite literally the next best thing, right? To be steward is to be the next best thing to king, but it's not quite the same. Denethor's power is one that he holds in proxy. Theoden's power is divinely appointed. That seems to be part of the distinction, and I'm still kind of unpicking that as we move forward, and certainly we'll have a lot to talk about uh, after we get to the end of tonight's session, after we get through the Battle of the Pelennor Fields, and we see, well, minor spoilers, I suppose, we see the fall of Theoden King, and then when we get to the pyre of Denethor in the chapters to follow. So with that, let's talk a little more with Denethor, talk a little more about uh, swords and, and war, and also the prophecy of the Witch King of Angmar. Is Faramir come? he asked. No, said Gandalf, but he still lived when... I'm not doing my Gandalf voice, I don't know why. No, said Gandalf, but he still lived when I left him. Yet he is resolved to stay with the rear guard, lest the retreat over the Pelennor become a rout. He may perhaps hold his men together long enough, but I doubt it. He is pitted against a foe too great, for one has come that I feared. Not the Dark Lord, cried Pippin, forgetting his place in his terror. Denethor laughed bitterly. Nay, not yet, Master Peregrine. He will not come, save only to triumph over me when all is won. He uses others as his weapons. So do all great lords if they are wise, Master Halfling. Or why should I sit here in my tower and think and watch and wait, spending even my sons? For I can still wield a brand. He stood up and cast open his long black cloak, and behold, he was clad in mail beneath and girt with a long sword, great hilted in a sheath of black and silver. Thus have I walked, and thus now for many years have I slept, he said, lest with age the body should grow soft and timid. Yet now, unto the lord of Baradur, the most fell of all his captains, is already master of your outer walls, said Gandalf. King of Angmar long ago, sorcerer, ringwraith, lord of the Nazgul, a spear of terror in the hand of Sauron, shadow of despair. Then, Mithrandir, you had a foe to match you, said Denethor. For myself, I have long known who is the chief captain of the hosts of the Dark Tower. Is this all you have returned to say, or can it be that you have withdrawn because you are overmatched. Pippin trembled, fearing that Gandalf would be stung to sudden wrath, but his fear was needless. It might be so, Gandalf answered softly, but our trial of strength is not yet come. And if words spoken of old be true, not by the hand of man shall he fall, and hidden from the wise is the doom that awaits him. However that may be, the captain of despair does not press forward yet. He rules rather according to the wisdom that you have just spoken, from the rear, driving his slaves in madness on before. Nay, I came rather to guard the hurt men that can yet be healed, for the Ramus is breached far and wide, and soon the host of Morgul will enter in at many points. And I came chiefly to say this. Soon there will be battle on the fields. A sortie must be made ready. Let it be of mounted men. In them lies our brief hope, for in one thing only is the enemy still poorly provided— he has few horsemen. So, Denethor has been wearing his sword now for many long years, sleeping with his sword now for many long years, lest his body become soft and timid. The Dark Lord has not come, but the Witch King of Angmar, Lord of the Ringwraiths, has come, and this is a dark moment. This, 
description here from Gandalf is one of the greatest descriptions that he's going to give us in the span of this entire book. King of Angmar long ago, sorcerer, ringwraith, lord of the Nazgul, a spear of terror in the hand of Sauron, shadow of despair. This is the real deal. Okay, Sauron himself has not come to the Rama. Sauron himself is not looking out now upon the Pelennor fields, but his right-hand man is, and the greatest threat in all of Middle-earth, besides Sauron himself, actually, yeah, has taken your outer wall, is now moving through the Falbor beyond your city walls, moving through the settled and civil lands of Minas Tirith, even though he has not yet broached the wall by the Great Gate. But Denethor takes this opportunity, too, to be a little snarky to have his shot at Mithrandir. Then Mithrandir, you had a foe to match you, said Denethor. Oh, yeah, no, he sounds pretty legit. Uh, sounds legit as Gandalf, in fact. Uh, weird that you didn't face him, though. For myself, I have long known who is the chief captain of the host of the Dark Tower. Oh, yeah, the Witch King. I know about him. Is that all you have returned to say? Or can it be that you have withdrawn because you are overmatched? A little little scared out there, Gandalf? A little, uh, little intimidated, maybe? No, says Gandalf, holding his temper, not being moved to the wrath for which Pippin is, I think, justly fearful, right? This could be a really bad moment in the history of Minas Tirith. This could be a real turning point in history. But Gandalf absolutely keeps his temper in check. It might be so. In fact, he concedes, yeah, no, I might be outmatched by the Lord of the Nazgul. Are you kidding me? Have you seen this dude? He's bad news. Yeah, even I, Gandalf the White, may not come out too well if we throw down mano a mano, as it were. But our trial of strength has not yet come. He says, no, I'm going to face the Witch King of Angmar, right? I, I have that sense. Again, this prophetic tone here. Our trial of strength has not yet come. It will, but it's not yet. If words spoken of old be true, not by the hand of man shall he fall. And hidden from the wise is the doom that awaits him. If words spoken of old be true, not by the hand of man shall he fall. This is the prophecy. This is the prophecy about the Witch King of Angmar. This is the prophecy that is going to take such a brilliant turn in the pages to come. And we should mention here that this is another beat in uh, Tolkien's ongoing criticism of Shakespeare, I suppose, specifically of Macbeth, right? We've talked before about uh, about the marching of the ants to Isengard, that uh, that this was Tolkien realizing the potential in, in what he saw in Macbeth. In fact, he thought that Actually, the the solution to the riddle in Macbeth, uh, the, the marching of Durnham Wood, is just not that impressive. He thought it was a wasted opportunity. If you're going to do that, do it right. Do it right. Have Ents march from Fangorn to Isengard and cast down Saruman. That's, that's good storytelling. That's how you do it. And of course, we're also getting a reflective prophecy here too, right? This is, we're not going to see Macduff. We're not going to see a loophole, basically. What we're going to get instead is... Again, spoilers for what's to come. I know that you guys already know this, but spoilers for what's to come. Eowyn is going to stand up and cast down the Witch King. Eowyn and Merry together. In fact, more on that when we get to it in the very near future. The prophecy, though, this idea that the Witch King of Angmar is not going to be slain by the hand of man was uttered by Glorfindel in 1975 of the Third Age. It's always weird when years in the Third Age match up with years in our own experience. You know, back in 1975, when disco was a real thing all across Middle-earth, right? Yeah, in the year 1975 uh, of the Third Age, just over a thousand years ago, after the Battle of Fornost, the quote given in Appendix A of The Lord of the Rings says this. These are the words of Glorfindel. Far off yet is his doom, and not by the hand of man will he fall. Now, Glorfindel at this point is speaking to the wrathful King Eonor of Gondor, who has just been ridiculed, I suppose, by the Witch King of Angmar, right? We're, we're leading uh, this this host of cavalry. Uh, king Aernar is, is leading a host of cavalry at the Battle of Fornost. The Witch King of Angmar stands up and the horses scatter. The horses flee. And it takes time for Aernar to, to master his steed once more and to try to return to the battle. And the Witch King laughs at him. The Witch King presents this as a rout, as fear of, of men rather than just of horses. We're going to call back directly to this in a few pages when uh, Shadowfax, in fact, stands up to the Witch King of Angmar. Shadowfax, the only horse in all of Middle-earth that can withstand the coming of the Witch King of Angmar. The specifics of this prophecy, though, right? So, so King Aarner is is threatening to to pursue the Witch King. He is in his full wrath, right? Humiliated, distraught, is going to set out after the Witch King. And Glorfindel places his hand upon him and steadies him and says, "No, no, no! Far off yet is his doom, and not by the hand of man will he fall." And crucially, 
there is no article there, not by the hand of man, not by the hand, not, not by the hand of a man, but not by the hand of man. And so Gandalf echoes him here. If words spoken of old be true, not by the hand of man shall he fall, and hidden from the wise is the doom that awaits him. No one knows exactly what's going to happen, but we've had this, like, like Glorfindel said a thousand years ago, that this is how it's going to go down, and... I don't know what that means. And maybe it means because, of course, Gandalf is, well, Gandalf the immortal spirit is currently in the guise of a man. You'll remember back in the pages of The Hobbit, Gandalf is routinely described as being a man. He is a wizard, but a wizard is his job rather than his innate nature, I suppose. And even here in the pages of The Lord of the Rings, that line has been a little ambiguous. He's clearly not like other men entirely, but he's not not like other men. Is Gandalf fearful that Glorfindel's prophecy includes him, that he won't be able to strike down the Witch King of Angmar? And thus, is that why Gandalf believes that they may, in or, or that he may, in fact, be overmatched when their uh, trial of strength should finally come around? Well, perhaps. More on the Witch King of Angmar at the end of this chapter, and much more on the Witch King of Angmar in next week's reading. Yeah. Uh, yes, Jackie pointing out here, Gandalf's very careful and precise here with the retelling of the prophecy. Yes, indeed he is. He is. Um... Because I think we don't, <laughs> because I think Tolkien doesn't, and I'm, I'm loath as ever to kind of credit the professor with specific impulses here, to say that he will not fall by the hand of man, not by the hand of man will he fall, that is good, solid, noble elvish construction, right? That is the kind of thing that Glorfindel would say. Glorfindel would probably not take that extra step into explicit prophecy and not by the hand of a man will he fall, even though that would be kind of connotatively ambiguous even in its initial pronouncement, right? But Gandalf is echoing very specifically the words, and I think that is because Tolkien wants to preserve that final reveal. He wants it foreshadowed, of course. He wants us to understand the prophecy that the Witch King of Angmar is the real deal. Not by hand of man will he fall, well, damn, because that's actually all we've got. That's that's all we've got. Uh, Pippin? Pippin can maybe do it, but even then, the role of hobbits, uh, or the, the nature of hobbits, is not so very distinct that we could be sure that he had a fighting chance against the Witch King of Angmar, besides the fact that he's Peregrine Took, right? He obviously doesn't have a, uh, have a shot against the Witch King of Angmar. So I think that we're foreshadowing the prophecy, but we're not doing it so explicitly that we can anticipate the final beat there. Tolkien is preserving his own narrative integrity so that when the prophecy comes to pass, when we get that final confrontation with the Witch King of Angmar, it will be both emotionally and logically satisfying, but also a reveal, a major reveal at that time. Let's uh, <laughs> let's keep going forward. Well, Helm Scream saying, uh, Glorfindel's prophecy is much more useful than Vroom Fondel's. Yeah, um, I'm not sure that uh, Vroom Fondel's prophecies would have been as, as generally applicable, right? I don't think that he had that great... Uh, that great kingly aspect that we've attributed here to Aragorn and to uh, to Gandalf and to Glorfindel too, I dare say. Rumfondel's uh, prophecy. This is uh, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, of course. Uh, Rumfondel's uh, prophecies are. Yeah, much, much less useful, in fact. All right, let's, uh, <laughs> very good Kant observing, maybe Glorfindel had trouble with his indefinite articles in Westron. Yeah, you know, maybe, maybe. And Joseph saying, Elrond has discussed you, oh, back in 1975? Yeah, no, Glorfindel, right? Glorfindel, absolutely. But, you know, Glorfindel doesn't need to advertise. Which is, a that's the first Disco Stew joke in The Simpsons, isn't it? Isn't that the joke about Homer rhinestoning his jacket? How do I remember that? How have I forgotten so many details of my own actual real life and yet remember this ridiculous minutia about The Simpsons? The world is a mystery, you guys, and our brains the greatest mystery of all. Let's keep pushing on with the return, somewhat ignobly, of Faramir. Last of all, he came. His men passed in, the mounted knights returned, and at their rear the banner of Dol Amroth and the prince. And in his arms before him on his horse he bore the body of his kinsman, Faramir, son of Denethor, found upon the stricken field. Faramir! Faramir! men cried, weeping in the streets, but he did not answer, and they bore him away up the winding road to the citadel and his father. Even as the Nazgul had swerved aside from the onset of the white rider, there came flying a deadly dart, and Faramir, as he held at bay a mounted champion of Harad, had fallen to the earth. Only the charge of Dol Amroth had saved him from the red Southland swords that would have hewed him as he lay. The Prince Imrahil brought Faramir to the White Tower, and he said, Your son has returned, Lord, after great deeds. But he and he told them all he had seen. But Denethor rose and looked on the face of his son and was silent. Then he bade them make a bed in the chamber and lay Faramir upon it and depart. But he himself went up alone into the secret room under the summit of the tower, and many who looked up thither at that time saw a pale light that gleamed and flickered from the narrow windows for a while and then flashed and went out. 
And when Denethor descended again, he went to Faramir, and sat beside him without speaking, that the face of the Lord was grey, more death-like than his son's. So Faramir has fallen, fallen to a deadly dart, an arrow has caught Faramir all unawares, and he would have been killed if not for the ride of the... Uh, the men of Dol Amroth, you'll remember the uh, the marshaled forces that rode up from the south in diminished number because of the rampaging corsairs who are currently afflicting the southlands uh, uh, further down the Anduin than, uh, than Minas Tirith. Um, Prince Imrahil here deserves a note all his own. I kind of mentioned him in passing when he first showed up in the prose and he's had attributed dialogue before this, but this is the point, I guess, at which we'll uh, take just a moment to talk about him. Prince Imrahil is, is Denethor's brother-in-law. That's why he bore the body of his kinsman, Farron Faramir, son of Denethor, found upon the stricken field. That is because Faramir is literally his kinsman. Faramir is literally his nephew. This is not like a, uh, this is not kinsman in the, the mythic sense in which, you know, all men are kin unto each other. No, he's literally his nephew. Uh, Denethor married uh, Imrahil's older sister, in fact. She died in 2988 of the Third Age, or 30 some years ago, 31 years ago, I suppose, because, and this is the interesting part, because she was weakened by the birth of of Faramir, and she never fully recovered, dying at the age of 38. So thus we learn two things. A, that Faramir is Imrahil's nephew, and secondly, that there may be more to the story of Denethor and Faramir than we previously thought. It may not be just the case that Faramir is inferior to Boromir in those virtues which Denethor holds to be most important. That is to say that he is, well, wise, where Boromir is capable? Well, that doesn't sound entirely fair either, does it? Faramir is a gentler soul than Boromir. He is a less martial spirit than, for, uh, than Boromir, and that certainly accounts, I think, for, for Denethor's favoritism. And, of course, Gandalf acknowledged this when he said that the blood of Numenor flows more true in Denethor than in, God, any man yet living, not including, you know, someone who may be returning to claim the throne of Gondor in the very near future. But Denethor is pretty damn Numenorian, and also so is Boromir. Faramir, less so. Faramir is more... Well, he is still a high man, of course, to, to borrow his own taxonomy that he shared with Frodo back at Henneth Anun. He has not yet, you know, fallen into the, the category of middlemen, the way that the writers of Rohan are, but he's also not a great man of Numenorean blood, the way that his father is, the way that, that his brother was. But also we might speculate that Denethor is hurt by the presence of Faramir, because Faramir's birth, in effect, robbed him of his wife, whom it would seem, from the lore, he actually loved quite dearly, despite the fact that he was very much older than she. But she died, as I say, in, uh, this is uh, Finduilas, uh, Denethor's wife and uh, sister of Prince Imrahil. She died in 2988 at the age of 38. So, Faramir is back. He has been laid out. Denethor now has no hope. And you'll notice in that last passage that we were reading in the last slide that we had there that he actually refers to his sons, right? This is the first time that he has referred to his sons in plural. He is clearly warming to Faramir for all that he has been barbed and critical of, uh, barbed with and critical of Faramir up to this point. He is clearly now thinking of Faramir's own mortality and now the worst has come to pass. It isn't just the case that Faramir fell on the field, right? That would be bad enough. Certainly that would be a, a horrifying outcome to this battle, but Faramir has been returned to Minas Tirith, fatally wounded, it would seem, by the, uh, the poisoned arrow that he took. Let's uh, actually, okay, so now here we are almost halfway through tonight's session and we're gonna catch up with the slide that gave us the title for last week's session. During all this black day, Faramir lay upon his bed in the chamber of the White Tower, wandering in a desperate fever, dying, someone said, and soon dying all men were saying upon the walls and in the streets, and by him his father sat, and said nothing but watched, and gave no longer any heed to the defence. No hours so dark had Pippin known, not even in the clutches of the Orochai. It was his duty to wait upon the Lord, and wait he did, forgotten, it seemed, standing by the door of the unlit chamber, mastering his own fears as best he could. And as he watched, it seemed to him that Denethor grew old before his eyes as if something had snapped in his proud will and his stern mind was overthrown. Grief, maybe, had wrought it, and remorse. He saw tears on that once tearless face, more unbearable than wrath. Do not weep, Lord, he stammered. Perhaps he will get well. Have you asked Gandalf? Comfort me not with wizards, said Denethor. The fool's hope has failed. The enemy has found it, and now his power waxes, he sees our very thoughts, and all we do is ruinous. I sent my son forth, unthanked, unblessed, out into needless peril, and here he lies with poison in his veins. 
Nay, nay, whatever may now betide in war, my line too is ending. Even the house of the stewards has failed. Mean folk shall rule the last remnant of the kings of men, lurking in the hills until all are hounded out. Man came to the door, crying for the lord of the city. Nay, I will not come down, he said. I must stay beside my son. He might still speak before the end, but that is near. Follow whom you will, even the grey fool, though his hope has failed. Here I stay. It is easy, I think, to overlook the tragedy of Denethor, to see in Denethor kind of what a casual read reveals in Boromir's character, right? And I urged us back at Parth Gallon, back at the breaking of the Fellowship, to look at Boromir more objectively, to strive to set aside those particular things which had led to the ruination of the company within Boromir's spirit and within Boromir's character, that is the temptation of the ring and the, the evil that it has wrought within the soul of Boromir, but to look at him instead, as Aragorn says, as the winner of a valiant victory. Few men have won such a victory, Aragorn says to Boromir as he lays dying at Parth Gallon, and he means it. This is not just a last word of solace from his king. This is a truth that Aragorn has has understood, that Aragorn has discerned. And it is easy coming to Minas Tirith and seeing Denethor all stern here in his hall of stone, flanked by these arrayed ranks of, of the stewards who have fallen before him, right? It's easy to look at Denethor, particularly in his treatment of Faramir, as being less deserving of our sympathy, less deserving of our pity. But in the aging of Denethor, I think we see something very important. We see the inversion of what has happened to Theoden back in the hall of Methuselah in Edoras, right? When Gandalf first arrives at, at Methuselah and he sees Theoden king worn and weary and corrupted with despair, bereft of hope, well, that's what we're seeing in Denethor now, too. He is aging, and it is despair that is leeching the life from him. He is without hope, as he says here. Comfort me not with wizards. The fool's hope has failed. Which hope is he referring to here? Oh, the enemy has found it, and now his power waxes. The it there? Clearly, the ring. The fool's hope. This insane errand that he sent two hobbits forth upon... Of course it has failed. The fool's hope has failed. The enemy has found it. Now his power waxes. He sees our very thoughts and all we do is ruinous. I sent my son forth, unthanked, unblessed, out into needless peril. And here he lies with poison in his veins. Well, here we see the despair, right? Why is the peril needless? Because there was never a hope of victory. Because there was never a hope that they were going to forestall the horde of, of Mordor here, the host of Mordor trying to take Minas Tirith. They were never going to do it because the power, the enemy, has the ring. So it didn't matter. It doesn't matter. Instead, he sent Faramir out on this, this hopeless task, unthanked, unblessed, out into needless peril, and here he lies with poison in his veins. Nay, nay, whatever may now betide him more, my line too is ending. Even the house of the stewards has failed. Hey, remember how the line of the kings of Gondor failed? Even the stewards now have failed, and his line is ending. His sons, of course, have both been taken from him. One categorically, one potentially at least. But Denethor believes now that there is no hope. There is no hope for the salvation of Minas Tirith. There is now no hope for the salvation of the men of Gondor. Mean folk shall rule the last remnant of the kings of men, lurking in the hills until all are hounded out. The kings of men here, referring to those men of Numenorean descent, right? The kings of men are going to falter. They are going to be ruled by mean folk, not the king, not even the line of stewards, of which I myself am a proud representative. The blood of Numenor has failed. And now the remnant will be led by what? Lesser men, middle men, low men even? Nothing good is going to come of this. We are at now the end of history. My sons have been taken from me. My line is over, right? If, if we concede the fact that Faramir is dead and that there is no hope, that, that his death has just been delayed a while by the working of the poison, but it is inevitable, then Denethor kind of has a point. His line is over. That's it now. And with the regaining of the ring by the enemy all of Minas Tirith will fall too, and the great shadow will fall across Middle-earth, and the sun will never rise again, right? The dawnless day will continue into perpetuity. There is now no hope of returning light. And as he says, nay, I will not come down, I must stay beside my son, he might still speak before the end. And this, this I find so very human and so very heartbreaking. He's staying with his son because he has no hope of victory, right? He's not going to accomplish anything even if he comes down. This is the last solace that he has available to him. The word of his son. Maybe, maybe a word of forgiveness. 
a word of love, a moment of connection, not between steward and captain of Gondor, not between, you know, lord and vassal here, but rather between father and son. This is what Denethor has been brought to, this stark humanity here, even in the midst of his despair. But that is near. Follow whom you will, even the grey fool, though his hope has failed. Here I stay. He's absolutely certain that the ring has been retaken by Sauron. He's absolutely certain that Faramir is going to die any minute. And the last slender thing into which he can pour his faith, into which he can draw any kind of strength at all, is the possibility that Faramir will be able to to forgive him. I read that very clearly, right? I, I think that is the last word from Faramir that he is hoping for. A word of love, a word of forgiveness. That seems to be what he is waiting for. Yeah. Yes, and, and of course, there's some conversation in the chat here too. Yeah, Jackie observing beautifully, guilt drives his despair for sure. Absolutely, it does, right? I sent my son forth unthanked, unblessed. Remember, we've talked about thanks before. Boromir has talked about thanks. Denethor very recently has talked about thanks. Oh, why shouldn't you sing me comedic songs from the Shire? I mean, we've been here, after all, protecting the Shire for thousands of years. We've been uh, facing the, the evil of Mordor. We've been doing it directly. We've suffered and suffered and suffered, and great men of Gondor has fallen. And, and, oh, not a word of thanks, by the way. Peregrine took not a word of thanks from you or your folk or your kind or from anyone else in the world. Does Galadriel send a fruit basket once a year to Gondor to say thanks very much for, watch, uh, for watching Mordor? No, of course she doesn't. We don't get a word of thanks. Thanks is important. And unblessed too, right? He hasn't bestowed his stewardly, parenthetically kingly, blessing upon Faramir. He could have given Faramir a word of support. He could have given Faramir a word of courage. Instead, he denied him at the last, and their, their, their parting was a bitter one. Let's uh, move into Denethor's freeing of Pippin from his oath. Messengers came again to the chamber in the White Tower, and Pippin let them enter, for they were urgent. Denethor turned his head slowly from Faramir's face and looked at them silently. The first circle of the city is burning, Lord, they said. What are your commands? You are still the lord and steward. Not all will follow, Mithrandir. Men are flying from the walls and leaving them unmanned. Why? Why do the fools fly? said Denethor. Better to burn sooner than later for burn. We must go back to your bonfire. And I, I will go now to my pyre, to my pyre. No tomb for Denethor and Faramir, no tomb, no long slow sleep of death embalmed. We will burn like heathen kings before ever a ship sailed hither from the west. The west has failed. Go back and burn. The messengers, without bow or answer, turned and fled. Now Denethor stood up and released the fevered hand of Faramir that he had held. He is burning, already burning, he said sadly. The house of his spirit crumbles. Then stepping softly toward Pippin, he looked down at him. Farewell, he said. Farewell, Peregrine, son of Paladin. Your service has been short, and now it is drawing to an end. I release you from the little that remains. Go now and die in what way seems best to you, and with whom you will, even that friend whose folly brought you to this death. Send for my servants and then go. Farewell. I will not say farewell, my lord, said Pippin, kneeling. And then suddenly, hobbit-like once more, he stood up and looked the old man in the eyes. I will take your leave, sir, he said, for I want to see Gandalf very much indeed, but he is no fool, and I do not think of dying until he despairs of life. But from my word and your service, I do not wish to be released while you live. And if they come at last to the citadel, I hope to be here and stand beside you and earn perhaps the arms that you have given me. Do as you will, Master Halfling, said Denethor. But my life is broken. Send for my servants. He turned back to Faramir. We will, of course, conclude with the Pyre of Denethor in the chapters to come, but... His intent here is absolutely clear. The walls are burning. The first circle of the city is burning, Lord, they said. What are your commands? You are still the Lord and steward. Not all will follow Mithrandir. And in the absence of your leadership, by the way, Denethor, men are flying from the walls and leaving them unmanned. And Denethor doesn't understand. Why? Why do the fools fly? Better to burn sooner than late, for burn we must. This is... Why would you leave the fight? What are you hoping to accomplish? Are you going to ascend the, the terraces of Minas Tirith, take refuge in the citadel? Well, okay. Okay, then you'll burn tomorrow or maybe even the next day, but you will still burn better to do it sooner rather than later. No tomb for Denethor and Faramir, no tomb, no long, slow sleep of death embalmed. We will burn like heathen kings before ever a ship sailed hither from the west. The west has failed. Before ever a ship sailed hither from the west, of course, he's referring to the coming of the Numenorians to Middle-earth, right? He's referring to the line that, that created Gondor in the first place, that led to him personally. But that line has failed. The west has failed. The west here, 
the spirit of Numenor, the blood of Numenor, but also in this more abstract and, to be fair, less Gondorian, more elvish sense, I suppose, hope and light and goodness and virtue and love, these things now have faltered. These things have now been cracked by the coming host of Mordor, by the power of Sauron, restored, so Denethor believes, with uh, restored with the possession of, of the One Ring. No tomb for Denethor and Faramir, no tomb, no long, slow sleep of death embalmed. We are now not, as our forebears have, going to be embalmed within the body of Minas Tirith. We are no longer going to be present in in spirit, if not in, or, you know, in body too, obviously, with the embalming, but, but we are no longer going to be a part of the story of this place because the story of this place has been consumed or, or is about to be consumed, is about to be sent up in flames, quite literally. The first circle of the city is burning. There is no hope. This is it. But Pippin, and I feel bad because for all that we've been focused on Pippin in tonight's reading in the span of this chapter, we haven't really spent a lot of time talking about Pippin at all. We will have the opportunity, I guess, to come full circle and to do another compare and contrast between Pippin and Mary, right? P uh, Mary too has been released from his oath. He has been released by Theoden King and he doesn't want it either. He also wants to be there. And we'll see here in Pippin's response to Denethor something very similar. I will not say farewell, my lord, said Pippin, kneeling. So he kneels first and he speaks in the manner of a man of Gondor. I will not say farewell, my lord. And then suddenly, hobbit-like once more, he stood up and looked the old man in the eyes like, oh yeah, I just remembered that I'm actually Pippin. I'm not so much Peregrine, son of Paladin, right? I am that too, but I'm also Pippin. And in the Shire, this is how we do things. We speak plainly. I will take your leave, sir. He said, you'll know, not my lord, not, not sire, no, no, sir. I will take your leave, sir, for I want to see Gandalf very much indeed, but he is no fool and I will not think of dying until he despairs of life. Actually, your lordship, actually, steward of Gondor, suck it up, will you? Gandalf hasn't given up. And while Gandalf has hope, I have hope Two, I'm not going to think of dying. I will not think of dying until he despairs of life. But from my word and your service, I do not wish to be released while you live. And here we see this transition back into the more Gondorian, more archaic, more syntactically complex uh, kind of dialogue that we've come to associate with Gondor, with Denethor in particular, right? But from my word and your service, I do not wish to be released while you live. And if they come at last to the Citadel, I hope to be here and stand beside you and earn perhaps the arms that you have given me. The sword with which he was girded in last week's reading, as you'll recall. Do as you will, Master Halfling, said Denethor. You'll note there the transition to Master Halfling now. Uh, a title of civil respect, but not the title of lord and vassal, right? Not the not the title of of, of fealty, I suppose, of, of stewardly fealty that we have, as we see previously in this line. Farewell, peregrine son of Paladin. That's the formal title. And then we transition to Master Halfling. But my life is broken. Send for my servants. He turned back to Faramir. We will get to the Pyre of Denethor in due course, but we are not yet done with the Siege of Gondor. We are pretty much done with the hope that we are going to get through all of our slides tonight, but hey, here we are. <laughs> yes. Oh, Jackie's saying, oh, this is so dark. And Becca's saying, anyone else getting a Henry VII vibe here? Yes, yes, absolutely, right? Um... I'm just, just scrolled just as I was going to start reading something here. <laughs> Joseph saying, Hobbits just can't hold down a job. Yeah, yeah, that, that's fair. And Seastar saying, I was thinking of the West as elves, Dunedain, Hobbits, Valar, and all the heroes that live to the West of here and didn't save Gondor by now. Yes, I think that's also true, right? The, um, I suppose when we think of, of the blood of Numenor, when we think of the light in the West, in a sense, we are accustomed now to thinking of these things as diminished, right? We, we see now the, the diminished blood of Numenor in most men, few accepted, right? And we see the light of the West as something now which is so very distant. I mean, past the cracking of the world, of course, the Undying Lands are no longer a part of Arda, thanks to the, the Numenorean rebellion under our Pharazon. There is now no West in the world. And it's unlikely, I think, that Denethor is referring literally to, like, Valinor. I don't think that 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 elvish worldview would mean that much to Denethor in this moment. I don't think that that's what he's referring to. He is clearly referring primarily to the blood of Numenor. But also, I think you're right, Seastar, too. This is a horribly mixed metaphor and a rather unpleasantly mixed metaphor, but like the fountainhead of the blood of Numenor, right? He's thinking of the goodness and the light of the West being an active thing still in Middle-earth. He clearly believes that that is true. That's partly why he is so proud of Minas Tirith, right? It, it flows still in the veins of Faramir and in many, many other men all through the city. Not perhaps the way that it once did, but still something. And also, of course, the hope of the West could also refer 
indirectly, I don't think that he means this this literally, but it could also refer to the return of Aragorn, of course, right? Aragorn is in some sense the hope of the West at this point too. Let's get to uh, to the final cracking of, uh, yes, Fountainhead of Blood appears in the collective imagination of the chat. Yeah, I'm sorry for that. I'm sorry for that. That's Wilhelm screaming in the chat there. Yes, yes. Um, good. And Wisdom Tooth here saying Denethor has the little brother syndrome to Aragorn. Yes, Denethor, one of the kind of, um, one of the clearest and most emphatic criticisms of Denethor that you can make that is sustained throughout his appearance in this book is that he has an insufficient perspective on the role of the steward. He, like Boromir, believes that the role of steward is an incomplete one, and it is not, right? In in medieval politics, it, it was an absolutely sacred trust to hold the power of the king by proxy. I mean, that's spectacular. You are not of a royal bloodline. You have not been touched or appointed by God, but you are getting to hold that power. You are entrusted with that power. That is absolutely a sacred duty, which of course Faramir recognizes and respects and Boromir did not. We must keep pushing on if we have any hope at all of even making it into chapter five tonight. We're definitely not gonna make it to that last slide. You guys, I'm so sorry. We'll, we'll figure something out. Maybe we'll do a little extra session before we get to uh, the Battle of the Pelennor Fields or most likely we'll just take two weeks to do the Battle of the Pelennor Fields. I think that'll be fine too. The drums rolled louder, fires leapt up. Great engines crawled across the field and in the midst was a huge ram, great as a forest tree, a hundred feet in length swinging on mighty chains. Long had it been forging in the dark smithies of Mordor, and its hideous head, founded of black steel, was shaped in the likeness of a ravening wolf on its spells of ruin lay. Grond, they named it, in memory of the hammer of the underworld of old. Great beasts drew it, orcs surrounded it, and behind walked mountain trolls to wield it. But about the gate resistance still was stout, and there were knights of Dol Amroth and the hardiest of all the garrison stood at bay. Shot and dart fell thick. Siege towers crashed or blazed suddenly like torches. All before the walls on either side of the gate, the ground was choked with wreck and with bodies of the slain. Yet still driven as by a madness, more and more came up. Grond crawled on. Upon its housing no fire would catch, and though now and again some great beast that hold it would go mad and spread stamping ruin, ruin among the orcs innumerable that guarded it, their bodies were cast aside from its path and others took their place. Grond crawled on. The drums rolled wildly. Over the hills of slain a hideous shape appeared, a horseman, tall, hooded, cloaked in black. Slowly trampling the fallen, he rode forth, heeding no longer any dart. He halted and held up a long, pale sword, and as he did so, a great fear fell on all, defender and foe alike, and the hands of men drooped to their sides, and no bow sang. For a moment, all was still. The drums rolled and rattled. With a vast rush, Grond was hurled forward by huge hands. It reached the gate. It swung. A deep boom rumbled through the city like thunder running in the clouds, but the doors of iron and posts of steel withstood the stroke. Then the black captain rose in his stirrups and cried aloud in a dreadful voice, speaking in some forgotten tongue words of power and terror to rend both heart and stone. Thrice he cried, thrice the great ram boomed, and suddenly upon the last stroke the gate of, Gron of Gondor broke. As if stricken by some blasting spell it burst asunder, there was a flash of searing lightning and the doors tumbled in riven fragments to the ground. Grond crawled on. The repetition there is so incredibly powerful. And, and of course, it's not the only time that we'll see repetition in this passage, right? Thrice he cried, thrice the great ram boomed. We are going to see, by the way, in due course, this moment from a very different perspective. We are going to witness that flash of lightning, this, this arcane release, I suppose, that accompanies the, the taking down of the great gate of Minas Tirith. We're going to see that flash of light and the great boom of the falling gate from a very different perspective, but remember this passage when we get there, I guess. So, Grond, we discussed this a little bit, uh, we discussed this a little bit last time. Grond is named for uh, Morgoth's Warhammer, the Warhammer that he wielded in his, uh, his uh, conflict with Fingolfin, uh, which just simply means, you know, club of wood, like, like piece of wood is, is basically literally uh, what it means. It was created in the likeness of the wolf of Angband Karkaroth, though. This is a hugely powerful thing, right? Great engines crawled upon the field, and in the midst was a huge ram, great as a forest tree, a hundred feet in length, swinging on mighty chains. Okay, so first we get the physical description. Great engines crawled across the field, siege towers here, coming across the field, right? But in their midst, something greater still. A huge ram, great as a forest tree, a hundred feet in length, swinging on mighty chains. Long had it been forging in the dark smithies of Mordor, and its hideous head, founded of black steel, was shaped in the likeness of a ravening wolf. On it, spells of ruin lay. The idea that this... This thing has been wrought long in the smithies of Mordor and has been 
enchanted and 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 cursed with dark magic, right? With with uh, this Morgul influence all over it. Grond, they named it in memory of the hammer of the underworld of old. Great beasts drew it, orcs surrounded it, and behind walked mountain trolls to wield it. It is unstoppable. So we get then, we cut from this description of of Grond rolling forth across the across the plain to the great gate of Minas Tirith itself, right? Across the Pelennor, in fact. Uh, we cut from that to the resistance, but about the gate, resistance still was stout, and there were knights of Dol Amroth, and the hardiest of the garrison stood at bay. Shot and dart fell thick, siege towers crashed or blazed. So the siege towers, the engines that we were just discussing here, no, they crash and they blaze, and there is still a stalwart defense. It's still happening. Grond crawled on. Upon its housing, no fire would catch, and though now and again some great beast that hold it would go mad and spread, stamping ruin among the orcs innumerable that guarded it. Their bodies were cast aside from its path, and others took their place. Notice how the Syntax changes there. Notice how the, the register shifts as we, we cut back to the defense of the gate and we move into a slightly less elevated syntax. When we cut back to Grand, spread stamping ruin among the orcs innumerable that guarded it. And then the repetition, Grand crawled on, the drums rolled wildly over the hills of slain, just slain there, an archaic formulation there too, not, not bodies, not slain men and orcs, just over the hills of slain, a hideous shape appeared, a horseman tall, hooded, cloaked in, in black. So this is the Witch King of Angmar, he rides almost to the gate itself. Uh, and as he did so, a great fear fell on all, defender and foe alike, and the hands of men dropped to their sides, and no bow sang for a moment. All was still. The drums rolled and rattled. With a vast rush, Grond was hurled forward by huge hands. It reached the gate. It swung. A deep boom rumbled through the city like thunder running in the clouds. But the doors of iron and posts of steel withstood the stroke. The doors of Minas Tirith would have withstood the attack of Grond. It would have withstood the assault of this, this fell engine of war from the darkest foundries of Mordor. They would have held, at least for a while. But the Witch King of Angmar, sorcerer that he is, summons forth his power and seals the fate of Minas Tirith. Then the black captain rose in his stirrups and cried aloud in a dreadful voice, speaking in some forgotten tongue words of power and terror to rend both heart and stone. Thrice he cried, thrice the great ram boomed, and suddenly upon the last stroke the gate of, Gr of Gondor broke. As if stricken by some blasting spell, it burst asunder, there was a flash of searing lightning, and the doors tumbled in riven fragments to the ground. Dark magic has come to the gates of Minas Tirith, and those gates have fallen. But we are not yet done. We have not yet tested the mettle of the Witch King of Angmar. It is time for Gandalf to step forth. Um, Seastar saying, have we no hope of ever finishing all the seminar slides? You know, not no hope, slim hope, perhaps. Hope if hope you call it. <laughs> I know you guys don't mind if we just run a little long every week and then just continue running there and back again, basically on an infinite basis. I think that's, that's how it's going to work. You know, by the time we get to the end of The Return of the King, actually, by the time we get to the end of The Silmarillion, I suppose, I'm going to be itching to go back to The Hobbit again. With all of the things that we have learned and discussed and studied, it would be fascinating to go back again to the beginning of The Hobbit. I am making no promise to you. I'm saying that very clearly right now. I am making no promise about that. But it would be really interesting, right? It would be really interesting to go back. I would also love to delve into, it's pretty unsuccessful, generally speaking, but I would love to go back into the revised edition of The Hobbit that the professor was preparing, uh, unfortunately, which he never completed because of his untimely demise. Um, but he was rewriting The Hobbit in the tone of the, of the Lord of the Rings. And it is, I think, yeah, much less successful, but there are fragments there that are really strong and really good. Anyway, all of that is to say, The Lord of the Nazgul versus Gandalf, fight. In rode the lord of the Nazgul. A great black shape against the fires beyond he loomed up, grown to a vast menace of despair. In rode the lord of the Nazgul under the archway that no enemy ever yet had passed and all fled before his face. All save one. There, waiting, silent and still in the space before the gate, sat Gandalf upon Shadowfax. Shadowfax, who alone among the free horses of the earth endured the terror unmoving, steadfast as a graven image in Rath Dinan. You cannot enter here said Gandalf, and the huge shadow halted. Go back to the abyss prepared for you. Go back, fall into the nothingness that awaits you and your master. Go. The black rider flung back his hood, and behold, he had a kingly crown, and yet upon it no head visible was it set. The red fire shone beneath it, and the mantled shoulders vast and dark. From a mouth unseen there came a deadly laughter. Old fool, he said, old fool, this is my hour. Do you not know death when you see it? Die now and curse in vain. 
and with that he lifted high his sword and flames ran down the blade. Gandalf did not move, and in that very moment away behind in some courtyard of the city, a cock crowed. Shrill and clear he crowed, wrecking nothing of wizardry or war, welcoming only the morning that in the sky far above the shadows of death was coming with the dawn. And as if in answer there came from far away another note. Horns, 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 in dark Mandolin sides they dimly echoed, great horns of the north wildly blowing, Rohan had come at last. I mean, if you have to pick the best passage from The Lord of the Rings... It's going to be tough, right? It's going to be tough because there are just so many. There are just so many to love. I think always of Gandalf pulling salmon through the window, right? <laughs> Gandalf pulling salmon through the window a million years ago, a lifetime ago, back at Bag End. That's one of my favorite passages. I love that quite a lot. I think of, of you know, the the scene with uh, Aragorn in The Prancing Pony after uh, Frodo has done his disappearing trick in the common room and he and Aragorn talk and Aragorn is leading him down this path of of revelation, you know, the darkening world beyond. That's that's pretty great, right? There are so many scenes in the Council of Elrond and in Rivendell in general, right? Uh, the, the facing of Carathras in the mind and more the boom 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 in moria that's all fantastic galadriel right you would have a dark queen all should love me in despair there are a number of just impossibly brilliant scenes in the lord of the rings and this is up there i won't say definitively that this is the best i don't even think this is necessarily the best in the siege of gondor slash right of the rohirrim slash battle of the pelinor fields i think there are some really knockout passages but this is extremely good in road the lord of the nazgul a great black shape against the fires beyond he loomed up grown to a vast menace of despair in road the lord of the nazgul under the archway that no enemy ever yet had passed and all fled before his face all save one and we get the acknowledgement to hear that uh, Shadowfax is enduring the Witch King of Angmar, that he is the only mortal horse uh, who alone among the free horses of the earth endured the terror, unmoving, steadfast as a graven image in Rathdenan. Rathdenan, of course, is the silent street. That is where the uh, the stewards of Gondor lay entombed and enshrined, right? So we're drawing back to Denethor even now, where he's, he's as still as a graven image at this point. And Gandalf doing his thing, right? Casting out evil in exactly the same way as he did back at the Bridge of khazad right? Flame of Udun, right? You cannot enter here, said Gandalf, and the huge shadow halted. Go back to the abyss prepared for you. Go back. Fall into the nothingness that awaits you and your master. Go. And the black rider takes down his hood, and we see the crown, but not the head. <laughs> I'm kind of reminded of Habarad, you know, unfurling the banner there at the Stone of Attic, right? I'm kind of reminded of... And behold! nothing, nothing. There's actually nothing to behold. I mean, at least here we do have something to behold because there is still the crown atop the invisible head, right? We still get to see the crown, but it is another one of those, behold, less than you might expect. Sometimes it works out that way. Old fool, old fool, this is my hour. Do you not know death when you see it? Die now and curse in vain. And with that, he lifted high his sword and flames ran down the blade. We are here. This is it. We are about to throw down, but for real though. And then the cock crows. And in that very moment, away behind in some courtyard of the city, a cock crowed. Shrill and clear he crowed, wrecking nothing of wizardry or war, welcoming only the morning that in the sky far above the shadows of death was coming with the dawn. And then we get this moment of you catastrophe. Then we get the horns of the Rohirrim. The men of Rohan have come at last. The horns echoing off of Mindolowin, the mountain behind Minas Tirith, right? This, this cascade of sound that indicates, well, hope. Not yet victory, certainly not assurance, but some small slender measure of hope. And of course, we're going to jump back in time now, and we're going to see the right of the Rohirrim. We're going to see everything that brings us up to this point. But this is a powerful moment of eucatastrophe. And eucatastrophe, of course, being that intercession of grace, that intercession of hope in hopelessness, it can't genuinely be a moment of eucatastrophe if we are still holding on to some slim measure. Gandalf is now being tested. If we infer correctly from his conversation with Denethor earlier, he doesn't even necessarily believe that there's any hope of victory over the Witch King of Angmar, right? He's challenging him. Go. You, you should leave. Not, I am going to take you apart, my dude. Not, I, I, Gandalf the White, stand opposed to you, wielder of the, of the secret flame. It's not so secret now, in fact, actually, because as aforementioned, Gandalf the White, check me out. No, no. Gandalf here, you cannot enter here. Go back to the abyss prepared for you. Go back, fall into the nothingness that awaits you and your master. Go. And that has seemingly 
no effect on the Black Rider, no effect on the Lord of the Nazgul. And I wanted to note too that repetition there in the, the first paragraph of this, kind of echoing back to Grond, right? In rode the Lord of the Nazgul, in rode the Lord of the Nazgul. It's just under the archway that no enemy ever yet had passed and all fled before his face, all save one. Tolkien has such extraordinary capability with those tremendously punchy lines, right? That, that, that powerful kind of almost monos literally monosyllabic in this case, but not always so, but, but very punchy monosyllabic de uh, delivery. It's just fantastic. I am so stirred by this. And the cock crowing, of course, recognizing two things, I would say. This, this is not the delivery mechanism of the eucatastrophe. It's certainly not the delivery mechanism of the eucatastrophe, but it is an acknowledgement of the imminent eucatastrophe, right? Spoilers for the next chapter, but when Theoden rides, he is going to ride with the morning light behind him. The wind has whistled up out of the south. A great wind is coming from the south and driving away the dark clouds of despair. Light is coming again. Morning is coming again, and the cock recognizes it, right? Far, not even a specific chicken here, right? In that very moment, away behind in some courtyard of the city, some, some irrelevant cock somewhere some rooster is crowing now at the coming sun but the world knows it nature knows it we are holding our breath in this moment but something stirs something is coming and that thing is hope in hopelessness it is you catastrophe itself it's an incredible moment i know that you all uh, i know that you all adore it see you here as i as i catch up uh the coming of the u.s cavalry the u.s cavalry has arrived says very Khan. yes yes and Joseph saying, wait, the Rahirim didn't just bring their special rooster of auspiciousness. No, they did. No, he's absolutely in a little uh, little wicker basket right behind Theoden. In fact, uh, he just hasn't had the chance to crow yet. This is just, this is the Gondorian rooster of auspiciousness. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, yes, Jackie's saying the professor needed a beat to highlight the dawn breaking, the return of light and sun, right? We just don't get that. We don't get that, that powerful reveal until we get it from Theoden. That's, well, okay. Two, two reveals to come, because even the coming of the Riders of Rohan, of course, not quite the eucatastrophe, not quite the moment. It's a eucatastrophe, but it's not the moment that we think of when we think of the Battle of the Pelennor Fields. Let's get into chapter five. You guys, I have 15 minutes left. I apologize for, for running so long with this, but hey, let's let's switch gears now. Let's cut back to Mary. Uh, let's cut back to the Riders of Rohan previously in The Lord of the Rings. It was dark, and Mary could see nothing as he lay on the ground rolled in a blanket, yet though the night was airless and windless, all about him hidden trees were sighing softly. He lifted his head. Then he heard it again, a sound like faint drums in the wooded hills and mountain steps. The throb would cease suddenly and then be taken up again at some other point, now nearer, now further off. He wondered if the watchman had heard it. He could not see them. But he knew, excuse me, but he knew that all around him were the companies of the Rohirrim. He could smell the horses in the dark and could hear the shiftings and their soft stampings on the needle-covered ground. The host was bivouacked in the pine forest, the pine woods that clustered about Eilanach Beacon, a tall hill standing up from the long ridges of the Druidon forest that lay beside the great road in eastern Orion. Tired as he was, Mary could not sleep. He had ridden now for four days on end, and the ever-deepening gloom had slowly weighed down his heart. He began to wonder why he had been so eager to come, when he had been given every excuse, even his lord's command, to stay behind. He wondered, too, if the old king knew that he had been disobeyed and was angry. Perhaps not. There seemed to be some understanding between Durnhelm and Elfhelm, the marshal who commanded the Eoret in which they were riding. He and all his men ignored Mary and pretended not to hear if he spoke. He might have been just another bag that Durnhelm was carrying. Durnhelm was no comfort. He never spoke to anyone. Mary felt small, unwanted, and lonely. Now the time was anxious, and the host was in peril. They were less than a day's ride from the outwalls of Minas Tirith that encircled the townlands. Scouts had been sent ahead. Some had not returned. Others hastening back had reported that the road was held in force against them. A host of the enemy was encamped upon it three miles west of Amundin, and some strength of men was already thrusting along the road and was no more than three leagues away. Orcs were roving in the hills and woods along the roadside. The king and Eomer heard, uh, held council in the watches of the night. Mary wanted somebody to talk to, and he thought of Pippin. But that only increased his restlessness. Poor Pippin shut up in the great city of stone, lonely and afraid. Mary wished he was a tall rider like Aomer and could blow a horn or something and go galloping to his rescue. He sat up listening to the drums that were beating again, now nearer at hand. Presently he heard voices speaking low, and he saw dim, half-shrouded lanterns passing through the trees. Men nearby began to move uncertainly in the dark. So... We have ridden now five days from Edoras. We are now in West Anorian. We are within a day's ride of Minas Tirith itself, and things are looking pretty grim. Not only do we know that, that war has fallen upon the great gate of Minas Tirith itself, but 
Orcs and wild men are holding the lands around. They are pushing still further west. They are going to challenge the riders of Rohan, and any entanglement here, any military engagement here, will not only spend the force of the Rohirrim where it needs not be spent, but will also delay them still further from arriving at Minas Tirith in timely fashion. I like, too, this beat at the beginning. Then he heard it again, a sound like faint drums in the wooded hills and mountain steps. The throb would cease suddenly and be taken up again at some other point, now near and now further off. He wondered if the watchman had heard it. I like this very much. I have seen some some readers of Tolkien refer to this as as weirdly arrogant, I suppose, of Mary. Like, who are you, little hobbit who hasn't been trained in the ways of war? Who are you to wonder if the watchmen of the Rohirrim have heard this? But we must remember that the hobbits have explicitly more sensitive hearing than men do. Hobbits are actually kind of at home in this environment. We must remember that hobbits can move all but silently, that they are attuned to the natural world in a way that the big blundering folk of men are not. The narrator tells us that very, very clearly at several points in the course of the book. So I actually like the idea that Mary is laying there, listening, hearing these drum beats, wondering if the watchmen have heard it, but also knowing that if he goes to talk to the watchmen, presumably at the instruction of Elfhelm, they will not respond. There seemed to be some understanding between Durnhelm and Elfhelm, the marshal who commanded the Eored in which they were riding. Eored is just the, the company of the Rohirrim, right? He might have been just another bag that Durnhelm was carrying. Durnhelm was no comfort. He never spoke to anyone. Mary felt small, unwanted, and lonely. So exactly what he feared would happen has happened. He didn't want to be left behind, remember? He didn't want to be freed from his oath to King Theoden because he didn't want to be thought of as baggage. He didn't want to be an incidental detail, and now here he is, almost literally baggage, almost literally overlooked and ignored. Yeah. Okay, let me see here. Um, who's going to call Aragorn blundering, says Seastar? You know what? That's totally fair. The Dúnedain, I think, are a little different, and Aragorn more different still, right? The, the blood of Numenor is still powerful in Aragorn, still powerful in the Dúnedain. But, and certainly the most powerful contrasts that the narrator gives us with regard to uh, the Hobbit's integration with the natural world and their ability in particular to move silently and unseen. He's contrasting not there with, you know, the men of Bree, let alone the Dúnedain or the men of Gondor. He's contrasting with us, right? With with modern men and women, with with the sadly diminished blood of Numenor that, flow, that flows imperfectly in all of our veins, I'm sure. Yeah, yeah, good. Yes. <laughs> Jackie says, not I. I will not call Aragorn blundering. Yes. Oh, so you start saying who in the story, I mean, yeah, well, again, yeah, not, uh, Rangers do, as, as Heroes and Bards is suggesting here, do get a plus to sneak, yeah, uh, the, it's so interesting, uh, this is, this is a pretty major tangent, but you guys, I don't think we're gonna get another slide done tonight, so I think that this is probably as good a place as any to stop, so I'm gonna take this tangent, and then, do we have any questions in the question bucket? We do have some questions in the question bucket, so I think that's probably what we'll do, but it is really interesting, let me cancel this slide, uh, next week, we will finish up chapter five, we have at least begun it. So there's that. Chapter 5 is a very short chapter, so we'll begin that and then we'll maybe do the first half of the Battle of the Pelennor Fields. We will do everything that we can. More on that scheduling in just a moment. Let me cancel this slide here. It is fascinating to think about about Dungeons and Dragons, right? I, as every one of my generation did, I'm sure, and as uh, every one of every subsequent generation did, kind of had an awareness of Dungeons and Dragons long before I ever read The Lord of the Rings. Like, I had played a ranger in an early D&D campaign before I had picked up The Lord of the Rings, or at least before I had thought carefully about The Lord of the Rings. And the role of the ranger is a really fascinating one. Ranger in, in Tolkien's conception here just means wanderer. It, it means nomad, right? They range, they travel from place to place. And yet it has developed into this mythic fantasy archetype, which is actually, in some sense, more kind of in line with what we think of when we think of Legolas than what we think of when we think of Aragorn, right? The bow-wielding ranger who moves silently through the forest and has like an animal companion, right? We're, we're kind of uh, co-opting that space between like warrior classes and, and nature magic classes, like druid classes, or, you know, depending on your exact... Uh, your exact rule set there. I'm, I'm fascinated by the way that Gary Gygax took the ranger archetype as presented by Aragorn, and it's no coincidence that they're called rangers, right? That has basically no history in fantasy tradition before Aragorn. It is used, but it, it isn't archetypally definitive as it is after the publication of The Lord of the Rings. I'm fascinated by the way that Gary Gygax manages to distill out the ranger from Aragorn and quite what that means. It's so interesting to see the arrival of a new fantasy archetype because we just, I suppose the closest archetype 
to the ranger prior to the Lord of the Rings, right? If we think about fantasy literature, if we think about fairy tale literature, folklore, uh, sto- uh, folklore in general, right? Not just the stories of, of folklore, but but also the the music and the the imagery and the metaphors and the the symbols of, of folklore. I suppose the closest archetype would be someone like Robin Hood, I guess. But Robin Hood does not sit comfortably alongside our modern conception of a ranger and certainly sits uncomfortably alongside our modern conception of characters like Aragorn or Aragorn specifically, right? Because Robin Hood is is an exile, yes. I mean, there are similarities here, right? He is of noble blood, exiled from his, his noble heritage, I suppose, much like Aragorn, in fact. But... In most versions of the Robin Hood myth, what you'll find is a character who takes the trappings of civility into the wilderness and overlays them upon that wilderness, right? That that the camp of the Merry Men in Sherwood Forest in most versions of the Robin Hood myth is actually a very civil place. It's, It's a stone's throw from the village and basically a village in its own right. It's not about the wild. He's not less civil than he would otherwise be, whereas Aragorn explicitly is. All the Dúnedain are, right? Think back to, to Barlam and Butterbur and how he talks about, about the rangers, right? No accounting for East and West, as he says, right? Talking about the Shire folk on the one hand and the weird rangers, the weird rangers who come and go without so much as a please or thank you in the East, right? Between between Bree and, and Rivendell. Yeah, the, the association there is very different. Anyway, I'm fascinated by that, and we'll probably think about that some more before we're done with the end of the book. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's really in Walker, Texas Ranger that the form reaches its apotheosis, says Joseph. Yes, no, of course, that, that's that's the ultimate realization of the Ranger archetype. Uh, that's certainly the uh, the template that I use whenever I play D&D now, yeah. I've, I've rarely played Rangers, actually, more often than not. I don't know, I tend to play either... I, my, my preferred character class when playing role-playing games of any type is the... Um, is the rogue class because I like having tools. I like having verbs that I can use. And I like social verbs because I like the collaborative storytelling, play acting side of role playing games more than I like the rolling dice side of it. So I rarely play like, uh, like warriors or barbarians or anyone who just rolls like a bucket load of dice to do damage. I rarely do that. I'm, I'm more interested in having interesting and complex verbs that I can apply to any situation. So usually rogue classes, sometimes paladin classes, because, you know, as you can tell by my love of Faramir, the paladin is the class, like the, the, the faithful soldier is, is is absolutely the, the character class that appeals most to me. All right, let's stop talking about D&D and start answering some questions here in the last couple of minutes before we wrap up. As he rides into battle, oh boy, Varyag of Khan showing a great deal of faith in me here and actually pulling from the very last slide that we were supposed to discuss in tonight's session. As he rides into battle, asks Varyag, Theoden is similed as God of old, even as Orame the Great in the Battle of the Valar when the world was young. Why is this the only time the word God is mentioned in Lord of the Rings? Maybe assign this use to a specific narrative voice. Um... It's an interesting one, isn't it? Because uh, no one, when The Lord of the Rings was published, understood this reference at all. No one knew who Orome was. No one knew who the Valar were. No one knew the battle into which Orome was riding. This is uh, a reference that is in there just for Tolkien. He just included this because, I mean, it's true in his his concept of his legendarium as he was writing at that point. Like, he knew who Orome was, but and this certainly is one of those details that gives us the illusion of depth. I like God in that particular instance because the tone of the piece, the, the the register in which the narrative voice finds itself at this point is already so elevated that a certain hyperbole feels not just not just defensible, but actually natural, right? I, I think and and also of course Tolkien later in his writings, well and and also imperfectly and somewhat inconsistently earlier in his writings kind of fudged exactly how we talk about the Valar, how we talk about the Maiar in general, right? He pushed back against the notion of the Valar being angels because, well, they're not, right? They're not messengers of God in the way that angels in the Judeo-Christian sense are supposed to be messengers of God. So that they kind of fall at the first hurdle there, but also their power set is different and they are closer to, as we've said before, like, like, the the deities of some pantheistic faith, right? They are closer to, in, in terms of their power set, in terms of their role in the history of the world, in terms of their interaction with mortals, and in terms most powerfully of their domain and dominion, they are more like the gods of ancient Greeks or the gods of ancient Rome or the gods of, of the Norse peoples, right? That is probably a closer bit of of mythic and... and, and um, what is the word that I'm looking for? I, I suppose theological transliteration here uh, than saying that, that the Valar are like angels. Orome is, is in effect, right? If we were casting this in ancient Greek terms, Orome is the god of the hunt. Just pretty straightforwardly, actually, right? 
we get into some problems about you know what exactly gods are and what exactly Orme is, but that's that's pretty close. So I think that in this sense, he's leaning toward that 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 classical pantheistic kind of of sense. You know, this this idea of having a a panoply of gods, each of which wields dominion over a particular domain, right? That I think is is why we use the word god there specifically. But yeah, I, I love the reference to Orme there because it is just so so fantastically self-indulgent, right? We've had, a, this has happened a handful of times. There are a handful of proper nouns that we recognize in the Lord of the Rings only because we have read the Silmarillion. And we must remember that actually it was, you know, 20 years. It wasn't until Professor Tolkien died that the Silmarillion was published in the first place. So we must credit so much, so much to the work of Christopher Tolkien. But yeah, no, that it absolutely does stand out. I'm not sure that we can link it to a particular narrative voice if we were to do so. Well, I can't see either Frodo or Sam using that word, right? And I can't see Bilbo using that word because if he's including Orome, the elves wouldn't talk about Orome as being a god. I could see that being an addition or an inclusion by a modern narrator. I, I would probably credit that to the artificially constructed narrative voice of J.R.R. Tolkien as distinct from the genuinely authorial voice of J.R.R. Tolkien, if that makes any sense, right? Uh, Tolkien the adapter, not Tolkien the author here. Um, Joseph asking, what can we infer about the connection? <laughs> okay, okay, we're gonna we're gonna talk about Wild Man and Pukkoman next week. Joseph, let me see if we can do um uh is there an etymological reason for the pair of vowels in the stewards' names? asks uh Tom Meyer here. Faramir, Denethor, Boromir. Um, it's just a Gondorian construction, apparently. We just really like that that repeated sound. Um, they don't all have that, of course. Uh, Denethor's father is Ecthalion, so we can see, I suppose, Ecthalion, right? The, probably a repeated vowel sound there too. Um, but it's, it's, it's less powerful, certainly, than Denethor, Boromir, Faramir. Um, I don't think that we can make anything of it other than it was a linguistic conceit that Professor Tolkien created when he was creating the Gondorian language, right? If you go back into the uh, into the history of Middle Earth, you can see various versions of names that just keep cropping up and keep being revised and keep keep coming around again, right? Uh, Elrond has belonged. I think the name Elrond has belonged to three distinct characters, two of whom have been unified, right? There was a character in the original version of Tolkien's Legendarium, right? What became the Silmarillion, who was called Elrond. Then when he wrote The Hobbit, which, as you'll remember, originally was not connected to the Silmarillion, right? These were distinct fictional creations. These were distinct secondary worlds, he just reused the name Elrond. And then when he was writing The Lord of the Rings, thought, okay, well, they're obviously the same guy. So let me integrate all of that history and do so with that brilliant Tolkienian kind of adaptive revisionism, I suppose, where he it would be so easy for Tolkien at so many points in his creative process to simply throw out the thing that he wrote before and say, oh no, that was wrong, right? Think most powerfully of Bilbo and Gollum. Think of, of chapter five, Riddles in the Dark from The Hobbit, right? It would be so easy for him to write the second version of that chapter, publish the new edition, and just forget that the first chapter ever existed and just say, actually, no, I didn't like it as much, so I just wrote a better version. But he doesn't do that. Instead, he treats the text like it is sacred. He treats the text like it is genuine, like it is authentic, like he is coming to it as a scholar, as an academic. And if you like what he does with that, by the way, go buy the volume of his letters because he does it to such fantastic depth. So many people wrote to the professor during the last years of his life, mostly after the publication of The Lord of the Rings, but, but some sometimes, uh, to some measure, after the publication of The Hobbit 2, asking him questions. Hey, where did this guy come from? Tell me about this guy. Why does this work the way that it does? And Tolkien doesn't assert in that J.K. Rowling kind of way, right? He doesn't ever stop and say, oh, it's this. Dumbledore was gay the whole time. I just did never mention it in any of the books. He looks at the text and says, well, if you read this, maybe we can infer this. And if we read this, then maybe we can infer this. And if we infer these two things correctly and we kind of stitch them together, then we can see a kind of greater point being made. And it is possible that some might say that this is the answer to the question that you're asking. It's a brilliant piece of literary analysis about something that he himself wrote. It's just fantastic. So I urge you to dig into all of that stuff. In terms of the repeat, I'm way off track here with the repeated vowels in the stewards' names, in the Gondorian names uh, in general, of course. Think of uh, think of Baragond too, right? We, we see a similar kind of... of um, a similar kind of phonetic morphology associated with all of the Gondorian names. The Gondorian names, interestingly, distinct from Gondorian Sindarin, generally. Not distinct from in the sense that they're, it's disconnected from, but it doesn't feel like Gondorian. I mean, consider 
Minas Tirith, Minas Arnor, Minas Ithil, Osgiliath even, right? And then contrast that with the names of modern Gondorians. We have actually seen in the pages of the Lord of the Rings an evolution of the language of Gondor, which I find absolutely beautiful and which is in no way unintentional. That is, that is definitely, defiantly, not an accident, I promise, because... If Tolkien cared about anything, he cared about the linguistics, he cared about the, the phonetic morphology of his constructed languages, and that's why they are so brilliant. That's why they are so beautiful, yes. Um, let me see here. Uh, Jackie's asking, did Elfhelm know Durn uh, Durnhelm was really Eowyn uh, if they truly had some sort of understanding about Mary? You know, I've never been able to answer that satisfactorily, I suppose. Um, does he know? No. Does he suspect? Yes, my reading of the uh, my reading of the don't ask, don't tell policy here with regard to Durnhelm and with regard to Mary too is that if any of the men of 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 Theoden's army, any of the men of the Rohirrim, any of the the men of the weapon take that is marching to to relieve the siege of Gondor, actually definitively knew that either Eowyn or Mary were marching to war expressly against Theoden's instructions, then they would be obligated to tell him, right? By duty and honor, they would be obligated to tell the king that these oathbreakers effectively are here among us. But if they don't know, then they can't tell and they can suspect all day long. And if Theoden comes to them after the fact and says, uh, Elfhelm, what the hell? Why didn't you tell me that Eowyn was riding alongside? I didn't know, my lord. She called herself Durnhelm, and I never saw her face. I mean, I, I don't think we ever actually spoke at, at all. And Mar no, uh, the Hobbit, no. There was some weird baggage on a horse that I studiously avoided looking at until, of course, it is too late. Until, of course, in the very next slide that we didn't get to tonight, of course, uh, th that, uh, that changes somewhat. Um, let's be done there for now. There's another question here from Hadrian about, uh, about the Witch King, but we're going to talk more about the Witch King when we get there. I promise. I promise. Okay. Let's wrap up there. Let me uh, advance these slides, actually, so that I can show you what we're doing, because there is a small change to our schedule. Gosh, there were so many slides that I didn't get to. There's a small change to our schedule next week. Next week, instead of our usual Thursday evening slot for there and back again, I'm traveling next week and some of it's going to be a little complicated and I don't want to run the risk of having to reschedule at the last moment. So instead of our usual Thursday slot next week, we will return with uh, the 60th session of There and Back Again with the rest of Chapter 5 and as much of Chapter 6 as we can get through the Battle of the Pelennor Fields, that is. So the, the rest of the Rite of the Rohirrim and as much of the Battle of the Pelennor Fields as we can get to. 10 p.m. Eastern, 9 p.m. Central, Friday, April the 27th. So next Friday evening for There and Back Again. And if in case you also join me on Tuesday evenings, usually for Dear Mr. Potter, and you have missed this week's session of Dear Mr. Potter, I should say that the next session is going to take place this coming Sunday and not on Tuesday. So I've moved it forward by, tw uh, by, by 48 hours. So Dear Mr. Potter should be happening on the 24th. It is happening on Sunday the 22nd. There and back again should be happening on the 26th. It is happening on Friday the 27th. Stay tuned to pointnorthmedia.com for more information about my upcoming schedule, which was kind of a riotous disaster this week. So I apologize if you guys didn't get your newsletters uh, effectively uh, at the appointed hour, but I, I'm, it's still constantly a work in progress. I will try to keep you all up to date with the schedule. You can always check out the calendar if you head on over to uh, to any of the podcast pages. In fact, you'll find a link there to the broadcast calendar for Point North Media. Right, that will do it for this evening, guys. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you so much for your brilliance. Thank you so much for your insight. I will talk to you all again very soon. 7 p.m. Pacific, says Jackie. Yes, I'm sorry. 10 p.m. Eastern, 9 p.m. Central, 7 p.m. Pacific. I should just add that in too. Maybe we can just go all the way around the world and I can just give all the times in UTC can't do the math to, to convert to UTC in my head. I've never learned that. But yeah, yeah, we'll figure it all out. Guys, thank you for joining me. I will talk to you all again very soon. Until then, fly, you fools! Fly.